Hi, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Goldsmith. Uh, thank you so much for joining the first event in our AI and the Society Online Seminar Series. Today, we are discussing new media literacy and politics. I am Tomoko Tamari, senior lecturer at the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship, Goldsmith University, London. I will act as a chair for today's event. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping points. The time permitting, we hope to open a brief Q&A session to attendees. Uh, this will take place uh, once all presentations have been made and our discussant has all spoken. So when we are ready to take questions, I will ask you to use the uh, raise hand option you can find it at the bottom of your screen to indicate that you have a question or comment. Once selected to speak, you will need to unmute your microphone. So if our Q&A session time is limited or you wish to direct your comments to our presenters and discussant privately, you will find their profile information and contact detail via our event right page. So finally, please be aware that this event will be recorded in order to share with those who are not able to attend today. The link to the video will be posted on the uh, event right page and on the ICE Gold Service blog. Okay, now we can start the event. So the main purpose of this event explore question of new media politics and literacy, and it seeks to understand the potential implications and the critical consequences of ubiquitous artificial intelligence and the digital technologies. Definition of media literacy can vary and have a long history. According to only Zero, I quote, literacy skill can be emancipatory only to the degree that they give people the critical tools to awaken and liberate themselves from their often mystified and distorted view of the world. This suggests media literacy is the ability to analyze the reality presented in media and to unraveling how and why such little reality is socially constructed. The key issue here is related to concern of how media can influence our perception of reality. The debate of media literacy also have a long history. In his famous book, Public Opinion, Walter Lippmann has already pointed out that people inevitably live in media constructed pseudo environments, since people are not able to directly reach real environment. Hence, people rely on mediated environments in which they easily reduce reality to stereotypes. It is, of, 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 of course, uh, it's obvious stereotypes are not neutral. The validity of Lippmann's remarks was convincing in 1922, but this becomes unquestionable today. So digital media with its current IT giant have become more fragmented with connectivity, more competitive with incorporation, and more profit-oriented with neoliberal value. In the wake of digital revolutions, we might need to consider old but new media literacy. So we might need to update our understanding of media literacy. So I'd like to just introduce an interesting episode which related to one of the IT giants, Google. Maybe somebody knows already. Google artificial intelligence researcher, Timit Gebru was fired by Google last year. But Gebru and uh, Emily Blender, professor of University uh, Washington was and five uh, additional courses submitted their draft to an academic conference in October. The draft demonstrated language AI uh, can consume a vast amount of electricity. Therefore, it is not sustainable and uh, reproduce unsavory bias found in internet. 
therefore they proposed AI researcher needed to be more careful with technology. Gabriel refused a manager's request to remove her name from the paper as a Google AI researcher. And then she was fired. Well, there are four insignificant points uh, from this problematic uh, event. First, AI is not sustainable. Second, AI creates bias. Third, the paper also claims everyone in the digital industry needed to recognize their significant moral and social responsibility. And of course, Google overpower an AI researcher who has a critical view of AI system. Then this lays the question, who can regulate and assess AI governance? And finally, the most importantly, we as user, we should learn that these issues are closely related and influence our everyday lives. In other words, we should be aware of what is actually happening in today's digital information society. So all of these issues could well be relevant topics for this seminar. So the seminar uh, will explore these issues by inviting three speakers who have been working on uh, inequality and bias in AI, discussed by Professor Kaori Hayashi, and the background of Google search engine and AI examined by Atsushi Udagawa, uh, and the uh, development new media literacy explored by Professor Shimizukoshi. So after three speakers' presentations, Professor Matthew Fleur joined the discussion, then followed by Q&A session. Right, okay. The first speaker I will introduce, Kaori Hayashi is Professor of Media and Journalism Studies at the Graduate School of Interdisciplinary Information Studies, the University of Tokyo. She is Executive Vice President of the University of Tokyo in charge of global and diversity affairs, as well as Director of the B, AI Global Forum which was set up within the Institute for AI and beyond at the University of Tokyo. She was also managing editor of the University of Tokyo newspaper as well as member of Broadcasting Ethics and the Program Improvement Organization, which is an independent self-regulatory organization of the broadcasting industry in Japan, and also a broad member of the German Institute for Japanese Studies. She published numerous, uh, numerous articles in both Japanese and English uh, in media, gender, and journalism field. Okay, so please start, get started your presentation, Professor Hayashi Kaori. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tamari, uh, for a very nice in uh, introduction. I'm sorry, I have many titles. I've been living too long, <laughs> too old, and but uh, actually I am a, a professor of media and journalism studies at the Interfaculty Initiative in Information Studies at the University of Tokyo. So I'm originally uh, trained as a media and journalism scholar. Uh, the reason why I am doing this uh, AI uh, is, well, I hope I can uh, explain it to you later after my presentation. But let me share my slides first. Uh, just a moment. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, I feel very honored to be the speaker of this very distinguished international event. It's about uh, new media literacy, what which uh, Professor Tamari said uh, just now, and it very overlaps with our initiative by uh, at the, with, uh, of our project. Um, uh, we have just launched this uh, uh, project called BAI Global Forum, and. It is uh, also it, it is a project which uh, um, the members in which members do research on norms, ethics, and practices for truly gender equal society, and uh, in order to guarantee the rights of minorities in the AI age. But I understand our project is uh, not only the research uh, body, but it is more uh, uh, as a uh, educational. Uh, uh, 
organization or, or body uh, at our institute. And uh, just let me just, uh, yeah, yes. And also I want to add that it is uh, funded by SoftBank, which is a big telephone, uh, mobile phone company. And uh, also together with the University of Tokyo, uh, larger uh, organization, which is called uh, Institute for AI and Beyond. Our research project, which is called BAI Global Forum, is inside uh, the Institute for AI and Beyond, which is more, which has an emphasis on more on the uh, inform informatics. So we are the only, uh, so to say, uh, unit which emphasizes the uh, humanities and social science aspects of the AI. And we uh, analyze and research on uh, the uh, history of AI, which we, we say before AI. And we also analyze and uh, do research on the AI's, AI ideologies, which we call behind AI. And maybe we want to, uh, we, we feel that we need to uh, do research on the foundation of the AI, which we also say beneath AI. So that's why we call this Beyond AI, BAI Global Forum. So it's not only the beyond AI, but it's also before, behind and beneath AI. That is our aims of the product, of our project. So now we want to uh, ask ourselves uh, this question, what is wrong with the AI? And uh, Professor Tamari just mentioned about it, but uh, I can also explain why we came to uh, worry about uh, the te technology, which is called AI. In 2018, uh, the uh, famous uh, journal uh, said this ha had this headline: "AI can be sexist and racist. It's time to make it fair." And since then, I I understand that uh, AI technologies try to fix the uh, biased algorithms, and they also uh, uh, develop the technologies and so on. But we still uh, stay uh, stand at the uh, juncture that we really have to to uh, to raise awareness. What AI, how AI how wrong AI can uh, uh, become vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the society uh, which we live in. Um, for example, uh, it, that, that this was also an incident in 2018, and Amazon reported this scraps internal AI recruiting tool that was biased against women because they only gathered uh, collected. Uh, Data that were skewed to uh, to to the to the to the favor of men uh, employ, employments of men. So uh, the Amazon admitted that uh, the, their uh, AI was wrong, and they just stopped using it. And beginning from this kind of incidents, uh, we have uh, the, the, the we see so many reports that uh, uh, cause uh, harms to human society because of the AI. And we also have the prediction that AI can also do harm in the future. For example, here in the news, uh, that, which is uh, carried by the uh, Nippon Keizai Shinbun, uh, Japanese women are three times more likely to lose a job than men in the age of AI. Of course, the, why the reasons? Uh, because AI, uh, women's jobs are more uh, the simple, uh, service sector uh, type of uh, jobs and these can be easily replaced by the machines and uh, we have to be careful uh, how ai uh, take over uh, jobs that uh, that human human beings used to take uh, used to uh, do so uh, we have to also uh, project the, our future how we can live uh, together with the AI technologies. Uh, and then uh, AI has a different uh, problem, which is uh, reinforcing the gender stereotypes, uh, as uh, Professor Tamari also mentioned about the stereotypes by citing the uh, Walter Lippmann. Uh, in Japan, uh, AI is easily associated with a very masculine type of, uh, or very biased uh, female image. 
here, this is uh, this this uh, screen is from the uh, Shinagawa uh, station in Japan, in Tokyo, and you can ask uh, what, which which trains you you can take uh, to this uh, AI uh, body AI uh, embedded uh, computer, and if you choose uh, women as a guide then you can ask whether she is already she has already a boyfriend or whether whether she is get she has she is married and when, and you can also uh, praise her hairstyle and so on uh, so this really enforce uh, reinforces uh, the image of women uh, without really um, uh, being conscious of why here uh, women uh, uh, appears in, in this way, because it is not necessary that what that, uh, sh that to answer uh, to 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 have a conversation about marriage and so on, but just because she is a woman, uh, the, the conversation she can she is uh, she is she was uh, so to say programmed that way to be become like a typical woman in J in Japan, and this uh, cover. Which is, this is a cover of the uh, Journal of the Japanese Society for Artificial Intelligence in 2014, and it became a big, uh, so to say, uh, scandal uh, across Japan. Uh, if you see this picture well, then th there's this uh, cord from this uh, from this woman, and, and this uh, the journal uh, explained that uh, the the scientists want to uh, invent a uh, machine which can uh, uh, clean the room, uh, like, uh, but uh, have, have also has a nice uh, image as of a woman, and uh, and the uh, association or uh, or Japanese Society for Artificial Artificial Intelligence apologized uh, afterwards that they use this very uh, wrong and skewed image of women. And they also even uh, uh, had a feature afterwards why they were wrong and so on. However, after that, uh, they still uh, didn't uh, uh, realize <laughs> why it was wrong. And uh, this is a cover, in, uh, this is uh, from their website uh, that they still use a uh, women image on their covers uh, that, uh, that uh, robots can be manipulated by scientists, but that these images are all women. So uh, women, women's bodies are used to uh, or associate this as something that you can uh, program and use for the use of the human, uh, uh, human society. And we really want to, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, overcome this type of uh, very uh, wrong, very uh, uh, sexist image of, Jap of women uh, within the AI, uh, AI technology communities in Japan. Extending to the, uh, uh, the sexist image of women in the AI technologies, uh, so there are developers who can or who who, who developed even the uh, harmful and uh, uh, crime uh, use of uh, AI for, for example, uh, re revenge porn and also this kind of uh, uh, humiliating women by uh, using this deep fake images in the pornography. Also, uh, this is uh, what happened in Korea. Uh, this uh, uh, the Luda. Uh, she uh, they invented this Luda. She she can exchange conversation with the users, but because she acquired so many hate speech, she also responded to all the to, to the users with the the uh, uh, with the hate speech as well. So they uh, immediately uh, uh, cut this uh, or detract this uh, this uh, program uh, because it, it it was really a harmful one. Now we've experienced so many 
incidents, accidents, and uh, also uh, crime, even the crimes uh, because of the AI technologies. So we have to do something about it. So how to address these issues? And there are uh, approximately, I feel, the four levels of efforts, and, uh, but each has its limitations. First, we can do something at, uh, at the individual level. Maybe we can uh, give uh, education to them. We can uh, give lessons uh, to the, each uh, developers or uh, even the, uh, give uh, literacy lessons and so on. Or maybe we can hold, uh, hold these events like this. But uh, beyond that, we can have more organizational or national or even transnational efforts. And first, the organizational efforts, the, the, the very uh, example we have just had, the Society for Artificial Intelligence, they, uh, they did something really <laughs> wrong, but uh, after that, they tried, to, they, they tried to be more aware about uh, uh, gender equity and, and, and also care for female researchers. So this, uh, this uh, 2021, they uh, held a symposium and in 2022, they had a feature about the female uh, AI, AI scientists and so on. And they even also had a panel discussion about the work-life balance of both women, for both women and men and the diversity, uh, the, the, the meaning of diversity in the milieu and so on. But beyond that, we also have national government, uh, which also try to endeavor uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gender equity perspective, but it's not, uh, it's by far not enough. Uh, but they did uh, set up, issue the AI utilization, utilization guide uh, in 2000, and uh, they also say that uh, uh, AI utilization principles, it includes uh, also fairness, the word fairness, cohese, uh, within the guide guidelines. And within the guidelines, uh, it has the, uh, the AI service providers and business users are expected to pay attention to the possibility of bias inherent in AI judgments due to the algorithm used in it. In machine learning in particular, the majority tends to be adopted and the minority is less likely to, likely to be done. So they do uh, raise, try to raise awareness about the principle of fairness, but uh, it does not mention any, so to say, uh, directly about the gender. And here, uh, basic uh, in the, also the, AI utilization guidelines, they also include the diversity and inclusion perspective. Uh, but uh, yes, what do you mean by diversity and inclusion? It doesn't really uh, specify uh, how, uh, what diversity and inclusion mean and how they can achieve this goal. Now, uh, not, that was by the Ministry of Social uh, uh, what was Minister of Internal Affairs and Communication, uh, but the, the cabinet office uh, set up the basic plan for gender equal, equity. And in that policy, uh, they, uh, they also, they try to mention about this uh, disadvantages of AI and uh, try to be, try to consider this, these this disadvantages in this fifth basic plan for gender equity. As, as you see here in this uh, slides. But uh, in this fifth basic plan for gender equality is issued by the cabinet office. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, the ratio of scientists, uh, women scientists in the, in, 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 in the science is very low in Japan, as you see here like uh, this is UK, 38%, 38.6% are women in the entire uh, science and engineering uh, fields. In the United States, 33.7. And 
here at the bottom, Japan is, uh, has only 16.6% .6 women in the entire uh, science and technology field. So, um, and they see this as, as a problem. And we also see this as a problem. And we have to but think about how we can increase women scientists uh, and also in particular the information science, uh, the women, sci women scientists. Anyway, so this is uh, the, they see this as a problem, but how, we can, how can we do this? It's a big problem. Uh, at, if you see, for example, at the University of Tokyo, uh, I checked uh, the statistics uh, as of November 1st, 2020, in the engineering faculty, uh, the master's degree, uh, the male uh, sci uh, students, uh, 1,914, whereas female students are only so uh, only 381 three female students are there. And it's likewise uh, in the doc in the PhD, a uh, doctor's degree, uh, women are evidently far less than men. Also in the information science, I think information science is doing worse uh, in terms of gender balance and uh, as you see, uh, we, are, we can be only pessimistic in terms of the number. Now, and this is not only Japan, but also in the entire uh, uh, tech fields, like, uh, and uh, this is the uh, statistics I had, I found in the internet that these uh, big uh, tech companies like Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, all are dominated by male, science, male, male, male employees. So uh, what, what we see is that what we, the, the, the people who create AI technologies or who plan AI technologies are dominantly, uh, dominated by men. And also uh, in terms of Japan, as I, saw, as I show you that uh, what we, uh, have or what we see in uh, related to the AI technologies are also uh, very prejudiced, uh, biased uh, female uh, or, or stereotyped female images. However, uh, we, we saw that there, there are many, there are initiatives uh, in terms of uh, organizational or national uh, levels and we also have transnational levels, but we will omit, I, I'm omitting the, that part today, uh, but at only uh, the, the organizational or national initiatives or efforts are not enough. And as you, as you saw that, for example, at, in the, at the level of Japanese government, the gender perspectives are uh, uh, evidently lacking. So we still, have a lot to do uh, in terms of introducing gender perspectives in the national policies. And we also have to, as we, also, uh, as we have seen, increase the number of women in the science, but it is not a panacea. The discussion on the gender equality has been limited to increase, has been rather incre limited to increase the number of women in the field of science and technology and we also, uh, also the Society for the AI, AI uh, Japanese, Japan Society for AI is also uh, discussing the work-life balance uh, for uh, scientists, but that's not really enough uh, because what we see is that we have also experienced that some very, uh, stereotyped women uh, images are created by also women scientists. So the problem of masculinity is not uh, only because the, of the lack of, uh, uh, the, or, or the, because the, of the, that we don't have enough women scientists, but we have to educate scientists uh, uh, across the board in order to overcome such prejudiced images of women. Or gender. So 
in conclusion, AI does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, the reason why AI has bias in, is, is because human has bias. And in order to create bias-free AI, we need to create a bias-free and equal, equal society at the same time. Everybody has bias, but we have to be aware of what, where we have bias and we have to uh, tackle this problem uh, straightforward. So what we should do, we have to do institutional efforts to combat unconscious bias. And also we have to make the public known about our challenges because many people in Japan are not even aware that we have these problems uh, in, in the area of AI technologies. And as we, as we introduced our project, we need, to, uh, we need to analyze the AI socially and culturally and historically for our challenges. And finally, we need to have a comprehensive education to raise awareness for the issues for all the scientists, uh, for all the students, and and for the broader public. So our challenge in, in the summary is like this. So Japan is ranked the lowest in the survey of the gender equality, but Japan is ranked the highest in the survey of positive public view of AI's impact on society. So AI's acceptance, the technology AI is very much accepted, widely accepted in Japanese society, but in this society, the gender is not, gender issues are not really, uh, is not, is not really much on the, in that, in the, in the, uh, on the attention. So we have to uh, fill the gap between the using the tech, AI technologies and uh, raising the awareness of agenda issues. And this, I think, is the mission of our project. So these are four missions of our projects. So analyze the discrimination and violence against women and minorities by the digital information technologies, including AI, and also the design a diverse and inclusive media scape by the digital information technologies, including AI and create an interdisciplinary global forum like this, where young researchers, entrepreneurs, practitioners, and other citizens come together to discuss issues related to AI and society. And also uh, we have to reconceptualize ethics for digital information age and practice and in, in, in inclusive education based on these ethics. So what we have done so far, uh, let me introduce some of the activities we have done and we are, and also uh, some of the activities we are planning. We have done a workshop of AI and gender on online. This is the, uh, we have a co uh, cooperation with a design lab uh, at the Institute of Industrial, industri in, 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 industrial science uh, at the University of Tokyo. Uh, this was, this took place in March uh, this year. We used uh, this program and uh, did uh, lots of uh, workshops. And also, we are also planning to do a survey or research uh, with the Kavli, Kavli Institute, uh, also at the University of Tokyo with physicists. And they, uh, we're planning to, uh, so to say, uh, set up a survey which asks uh, the public about their knowledge about AI, as well as the knowledge about the gender. And we, also give them a hypothetical question about uh, gender related AI use and try to see the uh, relationship between how people, how people evaluate uh, the use of AI uh, if they have more gender perspectives. So this is the ongoing project we are now doing. Also, because I'm a media and journalism scholar, and this is a bit uh, uh, 
different from the AI technology, but we also try to uh, uh, serve, uh, catch the uh, social trends uh, going on in Japan about, uh, for example, the hate speech within the Twitters or hate speech in the, in the cyberspace. And also that in conjunction with the uh, uh, skewed image of uh, women in the in the media and journalism in the in, in the classic uh, media and media and journalism me, journalism uh, in Japan. So we uh, have held uh, uh, I think seven uh, events already about uh, uh, the proper way of uh, reporting women or, or appropriate uh, image of gender uh, of image of gender in the media and we have we have set up a discussion forum together with the practitioners and the public like here and we had a really a good uh, resonance from the uh, public as well as journalism by uh, holding this uh, event uh, it, it has been changing in Japan that it used to be that people, nobody was really, uh, care, nobody really cared about uh, uh, gender if you are not a uh, feminist. But uh, nowadays, I think young, young, in the young, younger generations do pay attention to gender issues, not only women, but also men. And, uh, and I feel a good, uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about this uh, after I held these events. So, um, yeah, these are some of the uh, uh, titles we held about in our media and diversity forum, which we call MEDAI, about uh, the next, our, our next symposium is, is on the sexual violence and trauma reporting. And uh, we also want to uh, seek the solution against such uh, sexual violence in the uh, cyberspace and also, uh, also how to report uh, traumatized uh, experience in the journalism without hurting people who got hurt uh, due to the such sexual violence. Now we also set up this uh, BAI uh, RA research assistant league, which we call viral. And these are the, uh, the young researchers who are interested in the AI technologies and uh, uh, they, uh, hold, they are holding symposium and workshops every month uh, according to their, uh, their own uh, interest about, for example, fact checking or use of internet for the disabled people and so on. So I think uh, I have talked enough about our project. Uh, I hope uh, you have, uh, you came to become interest, interested in a glo BAI Global Forum. And if you are interested, uh, please uh, join our email, uh, mailing address uh, list and we can give you the uh, the notice of our events so that you can also join and think together about the future of AI technologies. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, that's very uh, interesting to know. Um, yeah, Japan ranking lowest in survey on the gender equality, and the Japan ranking highest in survey in positive public view of AI. <laughs> That's a very interesting. So they ask a question, how do we need to think about gender issue related there? It's a good question, I think. And also, I totally agree. It's important. The reason why AI, why AI has bias, this is because human has bias. And in order to create bias-free uh, AI, we need to create bias-free and equal society. This is really important point, I think. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we move the uh, next speaker. Um, next speaker is Atsushi Udagawa. Uh, she, he is a PhD student at the Graduate School of Interdisciplinary Information Studies at the University of Tokyo. He, his research interests include media studies and the media literacy. And he's currently working from an e-commerce company as a specialist of digital marketing and UX design. 
And he has been researching in the history of ranking systems of platform like Google. Uh, his latest English publication is Historical Media Discourses of Search Engine Ranking in Japan, a journal in so Social Informatics 2019. So I hand over the microphone to you, Atsushi, please. Okay, I'll share the screen. Okay. So thank you for inviting me to such a great seminar. I'm Atsushi Udagawa uh, from the University of Tokyo. Today, uh, Professor Mizukoshi and I will present you about a new type of media literacy and media studies about the media infrastructure. Uh, the media infrastructure is a concept including uh, digital platforms uh, like Google, Twitter, or Amazon. And uh, today's topic is AI. Now, from our perspective, uh, AI is already everywhere. It is embedded to the media infrastructure already. So I mean, the AI is not the technology, uh, technology of the future uh, that has yet to be realized, such as uh, autonomous walking robots or self-driving cars. But AI is more usual things in our daily life, uh, such as Google, CD, uh, recommendation of Amazon or Netflix, and advertisement on um, Facebook. And uh, even this uh, Zoom's virtual background is realized by AI technology or machine learning. However, uh, we are not so aware of the mediation of or existence of AI in our daily experiences. So the important thing uh, is how we can understand the surrounding AI embedded to the media infrastructure like Google or Zoom. Uh, to tackle this issue, the Professor Mizukoshi and I will make uh, two presentations. Uh, first, uh, from me, I will talk about an analytical research of uh, AI penetration in our life, uh, focusing on the Google's search algorithm. And secondary, uh, Professor Mizukoshi uh, will focus on practical research about media literacy for uh, the media infrastructure, uh, including AI-based platforms. Okay, uh, let's start from my part. Uh, the title is Google Search Engine as AI. Let me introduce uh, myself uh, briefly. I'm a PhD candidate and now working on my doctoral thesis. My uh, work experience began as a software engineer in IBM Japan. And now I'm working on the Japanese platform company, Rakuten. Uh, Rakuten is the, one of the largest e-commerce company in Japan. Uh, it is similar to Amazon. So uh, I'm an insider of the digital platform and also a researcher of the digital platform uh, trying to criticize it. And my research interests are uh, first, uh, why digital platforms or AI become black box in the society. That this is from a perspective of media studies or software studies. And second, uh, how general users can tackle against the black box platforms. That this is a matter uh, of uh, media literacy or software literacy. Now I need to touch upon the definition of black box. The Bruno Rato mentioned like this, the way scientific and technical work is made invisible by, own its, uh, by its own success. When a uh, machine runs efficiently, uh, when a matter of fact is settled, one need focus only on its inputs and outputs and not on its internal complexity. If we apply this concept to the digital platform or AI, a black box uh, is not constructed by a platform itself, but by users who don't care about the technology inside because they believe they can successfully get outputs 
uh, without thinking about processes. The point is a uh, black box is constructed by collaborative interaction of multiple actors. To clarify this matter, uh, we need to analyze how multiple actors contribute to build a black box. This is a question of my doctoral thesis. And the uh, thesis consists of two parts. The first is study from the general user's perspective, analyzing the media discourses of PC magazines and about search engines. And second is the study from the webmaster's perspective, uh, focusing on the communication among search engine optimization community, SEO community. Today, I will talk about study two uh, mainly. Now uh, we need to clarify uh, what is the search engine rankings. Now, as you know, the search engine provides the search results uh, with an ordered list based on the user's query. Now, this is a ranking list uh, scored by Google's algorithm utilizing AI technology. Basically, uh, the higher rank should be relevant to what users want to know. But uh, in our daily life, most users don't care about the, how these rankings are calculated by algorithm. And uh, even some users are not aware that uh, uh, such results are made by ranking. So consequently, uh, the search engine rankings are treated as a black box. So it means that uh, users unconsciously behave according to the ranking without awareness of the mediation of the technology. The one issue of the uh, black box ranking uh, is uh, popularity circulation. It means that a recursive reproduction of ranking. This chart uh, shows the click through rate of Google search results by ranking position. Clearly, uh, users uh, click on click only uh, higher rankings, especially the first position. The click rate is almost thirty percent. Now on the other hand, the uh, uh, tenth position, it's only 2.5%. And it is said that uh, less than 1% of users view the second page. The point is uh, the click-through rate, CTR, uh, is one of the major parameters to calculate the ranking itself. So that this is a recursive structure of ranking algorithm. So the, uh, if uh, this circulation uh, was applied repeatedly, the high ranked pages become more popular and unpopular pages become dismissed. Now, even uh, if uh, the, it is more accurate than higher ranked pages, maybe that this is uh, also related the matter to uh, amplifying the uh, social biases or stereotypes. I think this is the uh, same structure. And it's more of the problem that uh, just high-ranked pages are not always correct. That is related to the second point, the ranking hack. The some webmasters, the sender of the website, are trying to raise ranking by using various techno techniques. This activity is called SEO, a search engine optimization. And SEO is one of the most important and uh, usual web marketing techniques that almost all webmasters are applying. As a result, search engine ranking is the battlefield of webmasters and sometimes kind of fake news could appear in higher ranks. 
by hacking the Google algorithm. But from Google's perspective, they want to keep rankings as a successful black box. So as a result, uh, Google frequently changes their ranking algorithm according to the webmaster's SEO hacks. So uh, the ranking algorithm itself uh, has been forced to change to accommodate SEO and that has affected the ranking circulation as well. Then the next question is the, how we can tackle against these issues of black box rankings. First of all, uh, we should research how Google's algorithm has been transformed in interaction with SEO by webmasters. And based on the fundamental understanding of the research, we can think about the way of developing a media literacy for these software and infrastructure. This is why I'm researching interactions among SEO community for webmasters. Let me briefly introduce the research I currently working on about the SEO community. I'm trying to clarify uh, historical changes of discourses among SEO community utilizing content analysis, techno, uh, uh, content analysis methodology. I have analyzed the webmasters forum, a Japanese uh, major web community for webmasters operated by an IT publishing company. The website is uh, similar to search engine land in the US. And I analyzed that uh, 1,772 articles as total. Uh, this includes uh, all articles categorized as SEO published from uh, 2006 to 2020. And the content analysis was made by utilizing KH Coda, a Japanese major text mining tool. Today, I'll touch upon the results briefly. I analyzed all the SEO related articles uh, in the website, including titles, authors, and body text. And uh, based on the fundamental statistics of the word frequencies, I made a coding rule uh, to categorize topics. After defining coding rules, I conducted uh, the co-occurrence network analysis in order to trace the changing topics year by year. And here is the result of the co-occurrence network. As the source language is Japanese, uh, but I've uh, translated all the codes into English. The circle in the chart uh, indicates the cause of topics. And line uh, means the uh, co-occurrence relations based on the Jacquard score. Also the squares are the years uh, when the article is published. If the relation between cause and years are strong, uh, these are located in year. So uh, the featured topics of each year located the same area. And this is also uh, used to uh, categorize years uh, based on the topics mentioned. From this analysis, I can divide uh, the uh, three periods based on the topics mentioned. The first period is from 2006 to 2010. I call it as the uh, multiple search engine period. And the second is from the, uh, 2011 to 2015. This is the Google's domination of the desktop web period. And the last is the from the 2016 to 2020. I can call it as the Google's response to the emergence of mobile and app period. I'll explain uh, it 
in details. The first period, I call it the uh, multiple search engine period. Uh, this is a chart. The uh, featured codes are shown left side. The, for example, there are some codes to distinguish search engines like Google, Yahoo, or MSN. MSN means the Microsoft network. And also the mentioned about the traditional search engine technologies, uh, such as uh, ranking, indexing, or page rank. The topic was the difference among multiple search engines and the technologies themselves at this moment. So uh, the points are that Google was not so dominant in the 2000s in Japan and uh, webmasters were forced to optimize to multiple search engines. Actually, there are some articles mentioned like, uh, we need to handle both Yahoo and Google. Now, this implies that webmasters don't have to obey Google's direction at that time. But uh, this situation gradually changed uh, from 2011 it can be called as the Google's domination of the desktop web period. The major cause mentioned uh, in this period is uh, gradually changed. It has been shifted to Google's standards. Now, for example, Panda or Penguin, uh, uh, this is the internal code name of Google's algorithm update. And a uh, more important thing is uh, many articles mentioned about Google's power of standardiz standardization, like the penalty, inspection, or webmaster tools. Webmaster tools is the name of site ins inspection tool provided by Google. In this period, the Google create the general rules and guidelines of the entire World Wide Web, mainly on the desktop. The Google inspects web pages and penalize them based on their standards. Some webmasters try to hack these rules, but finally, most webmasters cooperate with Google's guidelines in this period. However, uh, the strong power of Google did not last long. From 2016, the featured codes, the left side, tend to focus on the various devices. Some articles mentioned about the difference between devices like desktop and mobile and apps. As you may know, the Google search engine does not cover inside of mobile app pages. It's only web pages. So Google tried to expand their dominance into mobile and app ecosystems at this period. These calls are like the AMP, uh, PWA or MFI are yeah, uh, very, this is the expert kind of uh, code name, but uh, this is very, uh, all related to the Google standards for mobile and apps. But uh, some articles related to the, these codes mentioned that uh, some webmasters didn't apply these standards. So uh, in this period, App traffic is relatively emerged and uh, Google's power of penetration weakened. Google's uh, tried to force their standards on mobile by announcing various policy like the uh, mobile friendly, AMP, PWA and MFI, but it did not work as well as on desktop. 
So uh, let me summarize the result of my research. I can say uh, the penetration of the platform is built and constructed by a complex interaction with the multiple actors uh, who use that platform, include uh, webmasters. The first period uh, before 2010, users and the webmasters can choose multiple search engines other than Google. The second period, uh, from the 2011 to 2015, Google dominated desktop web and inspect all the pages based on their strong standard. But recently, the after 2016, the Google's power was relatively weakened by mobile and app emergence. It means the dominance of Google and other platforms cannot be explained with a one dimensional understanding, such as it is due to an informational information monopoly backed by huge capital. So uh, it is necessary to highlight the aspect that the design of platforms and algorithms has been constructed through the complex interaction of multiple actors not only the operating companies and designers, but also webmasters and users. Now these perspectives are essential for critically understanding the existing of AI-based platforms and for fostering media literacy to envision alternatives to them. In other words, the black boxes of algorithms or AI are not made by the platforms, but by society, consists of the multiple actors. We, the general users, have not to leave it as black boxes. Of course, there is no perfectly understandable technologies by everyone, but it is important to keep trying to open these black boxes. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Right. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. You know, just sort of you're talking about there is a invisible sort of background AI and such engine. Just remind me a well-known proverb among uh, interface designers. They said the real problem of the interface is that is an interface. So this means, you know, ultimate goal of sophisticated interface design should be uh, more, be, should be more to make it invisible. So that's sort of, this is very important to be aware with you know, everyone. Thank you very much. That's interesting. So we just move on next speaker, uh, Shin Mizukoshi. <laughs> He's a professor of media studies at the Inter Interfaculty in in Initiative in Information Studies, the University of Tokyo. He has been working on critical and practical media studies to try to familiarize and recombine the relationship between media and the people with a design-oriented mind. So his most recent uh, English publication is Media Landscape with Apple. Uh, without Apple, sorry, this is important. Without Apple, a workshop for critical awareness of alternative media infra infrastructure in Journal of Education, 2020. So he's he's the editor of Independent and uh, uh, Bilingual ma Magazine Five, Designing Media Ecology, and also he's a producer of online sound media, Radio Five. So please start your presentation. Okay, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Tomoko. And thank you for uh, giving me this wonderful, uh, you know, speech opportunity for the ICCE, the Goldsmiths University of London. And uh, my name is Shin Mizukoshi. And uh, today I am going to talk about our, you know, struggle or effort to uh, explore a new dimension of the media literacy. I will share the my slides. Can you see it? Um, 
Well, today I use the word uh, media infrastructure or media platform. And uh, I have to summarize, uh, you know, uh, skip many things, but uh, these words are very much connected to the AI or robot. And it's like the both side of the coin. So if I speak, or describe or discuss about the media infrastructure or uh, uh, platform, that almost means uh, AI. So please translate by yourself, okay? And uh, well, uh, I have been engaged in the very practical studies of the media literacy for about quarter century or so. And uh, I, I'm trying to be a media theorist, but I am in a very muddy situation. But uh, I feel very much that uh, today, these days are a kind of the uh, renaissance of the media literacy among the educators or the you know, practical researchers of the media education. And it's because of the you know, uh, buzzword like the fake news or misinformation, uh, uh, you know, th th there are a lot. So the people <laughs> chant the importance of the media literacy like magic, okay? And in some way that's very happy for us, but in some way it's very, I feel very complex because the media literacy is not a strong and miracle medicine, but I believe it's a, like a harbor remedy. It's an everyday practice. It's, there is no such kind of this miracle uh, you know, medicine. And also uh, media education or media literacy there are prescriptions for it, like the design and the evaluation of learning programs, materials, learning communities, or kind of things. And uh, without those kind of the uh, discussion, we cannot uh, make a kind of the uh, you know uh, good uh, activities for the media literacy. And also, we have to be very careful that uh, there are discussions that uh, you know some some intellectual you know people believe that the conspiracy conspiracy theory like the media do this kind of things underground or kind of things and these kind of understanding uh easily confused with the media literacy <laughs> and another thing is that uh, there are words that the media protect protectionism it's it's a kind of the general word in the media education that uh, you know especially the juvenile world, boys and girls, has a very beautiful mind like a white paper. And media is coming to them to you know, uh, make up pollution. So try to protect the, the, the you know, angel-like people's mind from the evil media. This was called the media protectionism. That was criticized long time in the field of the media education and literacy. However, it's very strong. <laughs> strong ideology and sometimes it's connected to the political conservatism or extremely right-wing conservatism uh, trumpeted that the uh, media protectionism and that uh, make a big influence to the you know general people so today i am going to uh, talk mainly two matters one is about the our new trial for the new literacy for media infrastructure platform. And I will pick up some projects about, uh, 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 I will pick up some workshop uh, by which we are going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, try to dis discuss about it. And uh, another is that uh, uh, my uh, kind of the uh, model uh, called uh, media biotope, uh, biotope. It's uh, coined by me. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, we. 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 The general people uh, should try to make uh, their own communal uh, media ecology uh, by themselves. It's a kind of the uh, vision of ourselves. So uh, my presentation have two parts. But before going into uh, the uh, 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 these two matters. Here is a very rough sketch of the transition of media studies and media literacy. From my understanding, media literacy has developed under the strong influence of the theory in media studies. And uh, 
Uh, present media literacy has been mainly cultivated by critical media theories, primarily focusing on text, messages, and contents, and their highlights was in 1990s. But with the ecological transition of the digital te uh, technologies, including AI and robots in the 21st century, media literacy should examine not only the critical awareness of media text and messages and content, but also about the media platforms and infrastructures. And, uh, you know, critical reading or critical analysis of the representation of the media is very much uh, connected to the uh, literary critique or uh, humanities. And uh, humanities and social science people, gen uh, you know, generally speak, uh, have a tendency that uh, you know, technology like a Google or iPhone, these kind of things is a technology and it's operated by the big industry and engineering school people and they are outside of their, of their discussion. So uh, reach, uh, the platform or the uh, infrastructure is an engineering matter and that's not the object for the uh, analysis of the humanities and social science, and, and I, I don't agree to it. And uh, um, here is some, uh, I want to show one uh, video of the Stuart Hall, uh, which was uh, shooted in 2000 for the Open University Japan's uh, Crossroom Media Studies. I, uh, uh, Shunya Yoshimi, professor of the University of Tokyo, and I, uh, collaboratory and make these uh, 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 programs, and uh, we ask uh, the uh, we do the interview for the whole in 2000 far away, but uh, just stop it and. Uh, My early work. Uh, can you hear it? The, the book called the Popular Arts was really done in schools. It was done for school children. Popular Arts was a book for teachers teaching children between the ages of 15 or 14 and 18. Uh, and if they wanted to do work on the media or on popular culture, on popular music or on film and cinema or on advertising, there was no book which told them how to do that. There was no book which gave them any guidance. So popular, the popular arts is a kind of book written for schooling education in media literacy. And I guess it's the same impulse to democratize the skill of critical analysis of the media, which took me to the Open University and which made me interested in the Open University, which was using the media themselves as a medium of education and which was also talking to a wide range of people who weren't themselves academics at all uh, and trying to give them a, a quality education. And so we thought well, a part of a quality education in the modern world is to have a critical understanding of the media. So it is part of the fact of cultural studies having a foot in these two camps. On the one hand, it is a serious academic and research paradigm, but on the other hand, it has this democ democratic thrust or objective to distribute the skills of understanding and critical knowledge much more widely in the society than is currently the case. In this video, shoot it in 2000, we can learn again two matters. In, in, in this video interview, uh, Stuart tried to discuss about the genealogy of cultural studies. So it's not only focusing on the media studies, but if we try to interpret his word cultural studies to the media studies, I believe that media studies has two dimensions. One is very practical and educational and for the general people. And the other is a serious you know, theoretical or academic one. I believe in these days after Trump or the after Brexit, or we really need to, you know, how to discuss how to integrate in these two matters. So I am focusing on the media education. And second point is that in the 1968, he published a book called The Popular Arts. That was uh, almost the first book in UK about the uh, you know, educational and, and, and analytical discussion for the popular, art, uh, popular culture, media culture. And uh, before that, there are a few books, he said, you know, only in Marshall, 
You know, it's very interesting. Marshall McLuhan's first uh, book or uh, discussion is studied uh, from uh, you know, media education in Canada. It's about 10 years before Stuart Hall. But anyhow, um, we are in the situation that uh, what, what Hall is talking is the, the critical reading of the popular culture. But we are you know, living in a different world a two or two to one, and uh, now we should do this almost the same similar thing to the whole that we should explore a new dimension of the uh, media uh, analysis and understanding of the platform and infrastructure. So here is some figure I I, I, I draw by myself, and if here is a critical reading. And here is some active expression, reading and writing. Like these two are like a very historical, uh, you know, uh, relationship. And I had been focusing on this active expression, including digital storytelling activities uh, in two, 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 2000 and 2010s. And uh, this is on the platform and, and the contents level. And there are, here are some platform infrastructure. And I, 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 I have very vague idea. Here must be something, but I don't know very well uh, in, in, the, in, in five years ago or so. That's the starting point of our project. Uh, we did, a, a, Atsushi and I collaborate each other with the ICT industry and the COP people, cooperative people and uh, other interdisciplinary uh, researchers for about three years, uh, and uh, under the, uh, the, the the Ministry of Education's um, grant, grant, and uh, and, and I, I believe that I I I, I am loosely uh, connected to Kaori, and I am loosely uh, with the alliance with the BA Global Forum. And uh, also, uh, we have a future plan to collaborate with Bromas University Cent Center for Excellence in Media Practice. And uh, anyhow, uh, as I told you, there are some uh, prescriptions of the media literacy. And uh, we discussed a lot. And uh, um, this project has a two, dim two dimensions. One is a theoretical discussion, and the other one is a uh, producing a practical workshop style uh, learning program. And uh, there, there are four types of the uh, workshop programs. It's a very tentative idea, but the, from the, the from the this kind of thing, reflect on it, it because say, you know, platform or infrastructure is so natural, taken for granted. So try to defamiliarize, defamiliarize them is very important thing. So the entrance is very important, you know? So reflect on one's own media infrastructure usage is very basic one. Critically understand the existence of media infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. And then the last we create an alternative model of media infrastructure. It's not, it's not I'm not talking about uh, everyone should be an engineering master course student or something like that, but think about the alternative media infrastructure is very important. There are some way for uh, the, the general people, even the general people to do this kind of thing. And uh, 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 within three years, we produced, successfully produced a six workshops. And it, in 2020, it's very hard because under the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot do a face-to-face -face, uh, workshop uh, you know, experiment, but we try to make an online workshop. Uh, like uh, let's draw Twitter kind of things. And I can't, I don't have enough time to uh, explain about them, but only one thing in the T1 level, T1 is uh, one, and, one to two hours um, uh, for the reflect, reflection on one's own media infrastructure use it. You know, just have you ever, you know, read carefully that social media term of use just you click yes or kind of thing, isn't it? Zuckerberg talked, uh, you know, confessed that nobody, you know, read, uh, you know, 
uh, terms of use of the Facebook in the, you know, uh, in, the, in the United States uh, Congress. But anyhow, we, in, 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 in a very mass uh, classroom, like uh, 100 undergraduate students, a boring mass media studies classroom, we asked some student to read out, read aloud the SNS terms of use. It's very theoretical situation, uh, th theatrical situation. So not read uh, silently, but uh, you know, read aloud. Then it's very in interesting. Student understand how the imbalance are uh, you know described in the terms of the use. So this kind of uh, very uh, the artistic uh, the theatrical activities are uh, included in these kind of the workshops. And uh, I want to show today a five minutes video about our uh, uh, T3 level, uh, you know, uh, activities. It takes uh, two, three weeks, but uh, I think it's better for me to show you the video first. Can you hear it? 2019年の今、我々のメディア環境はどうなってるんだろうと。みんなで話し合ってもらって、えっと、シナリオを作ってほしいんです。このワークショップはですね、今あるこの当たり前のソーシャルメディア、あるいは当たり前のスマートフォン
大なインフラ全体を電車とセットにしながら海外にも輸出していく。スマートフォンやあるいはその他のデジタルプラットフォームが当たり前になっている中でそのプラットフォームを引き剥がしてみるさらに言うとイマジネーションという意味では想像するだけじゃなくて、まあ、本当に今あるのとは違うプラットフォームをあるいはメディアを、まあ、作っていくっていうかこう本当にクリエーションという意味での想像をしていくっていうようなことにこういうことがつながるとなんか文系とか理系とかそう産業界とか大学とかを超えたあるこう形になっていくのかなと、まあ、そのことを期待してやめ,、ま、やめませんっていう感じですねスマ,ホスマートフォンがあることでもうそういう便利な世の中になっていくっていうのはあくまでくよくよく考えてみると来るんですけど災害とかが起きた時は逆に別に使えないものになってしまうスマホに対していろいろな視点を持てたという。そのフィロソフィーというか文化みたいなところも含めて根源的なことを問い,問い直すというかまあ疑ってえと一応自分でシミュレーションしてみるみたいなところの問いにはなったかなと思っております。three years and I'm now trying to continue this kind of project from now on. And I will uh, uh, you know, move to the uh, uh, kind of the model matters. And uh, as I showed before, I cannot understand very well about this question mark phrase. <laughs> and uh, after three years, I have a tentative uh, discussion like that uh, here are uh, like a uh, very resemble uh, you know, reciprocal, uh, uh, how shall I say, activities for media education or media literacy, that one is a metaphorical understanding. I have very, uh, I have no time to discuss, uh, in explain you about uh, what, what the metaphor or kind of things, but, uh, you know, very complex digital technology, we need to understand them metaphorically. What the Twitter is, what the Google, what the difference between the Google's crowd service and Dropbox crowd service? We have some metaphor. An email uh, with a word file attached, this kind of 90s, 1990s uh, you know, standard and today's crowd service have a different metaphor. And it's like, a, like a George Lakoff's you know, cognitive linguistics approach, like a, uh, you know, we understand something as metaphor. It's very much connected to the stereotype discussion of the Walter Rippmann. And the other side is a DIY or D do it ourself, ourself uh, you know, oriented creation. We don't need to be an expert engineer or a scientist, but we can do a kind of bricolage of many things and try to use them in a different way and to make a kind of the you know, uh, DIY oriented creation. And these two are connected each other. And I know, I, I think that even now, content levels, media literacy is essential. I, I don't, uh, you know, reject those kind of things, but uh, we really need to you know, think the uh, kind of the uh, media literacy as this kind of flora like things. And uh, these uh, connect is very much each other. And, uh, here are some ecosystem and uh, well, um, usually these ecosystem are occupied by big industry, American big industry, and we have only the, uh, the, the right to choose something, um, Netflix and Google and uh, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I think, if we can make a kind of the communal educational activity, there are some, some, something, some alternatives. Um, in the discussion of the, you know, in the classification of the, uh, our future effort uh, in the Kaori's presentation, 
she is classified in individual, organizational, national, and transnational, right? And I think focusing on individual level only is dangerous. David Buckingham, one of the leading speaker in the media education published 2019, the media education manifest, and he was so upset about today's situation of the media education because media education is too much individual. You know, it's, it's inside the classroom. The classroom, each student have the high or low ability or kind. It's media literacy where media education is an individual ability. Um, you know, that's a discussion. The real media education or media literacy activity must be more communal. Of course, it's, it, it's, it, it will be existed in the classroom, but the community, church, a temple or the you know refugees uh, you know corner or kind of things. So I want to make a try to make a communal, experimental media ecosystem between individual and the organizational uh, of the colleagues you know uh, for classification, and it can be you know transnational. And I coined the you know word the media biotope in two o five. Uh, it's ancient time, but this is a, a, a kind of the name of the strategy to develop a small but networked media, uh, you know, uh, biotope. It's 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 small, it's small, but it's not only you know uh, alone. It's connected each other, and uh, it's it never completely deny the capitalized media ecosystem, but never bury it and do it yourself is. A split is very important. And uh, here is some drawing, it's mine. Uh, University of Tokyo here is, uh, okay. University of Tokyo is situated in Bunkyo World, Tokyo city. And uh, from, the, from the survey research, Bunkyo World general people hate University of Tokyo because the University of Tokyo is just uh, looking at Oxford, Cambridge, or the Harvard, and the global or uh, nation or something like that, and they they believe that they don't care about the neighborhood people. So from around 2011, it's just after the Fukushima or the March 11, we try to engage in the you know neighborhood uh, storytelling and the media literacy activities. And here are some some green, uh, yeah, uh, red, or blue, and these are workshops. We did this kind of thing in the community center, school, and circle, sometimes in the festival, and try to connect them each other. And we try to ask the local cable TV to make our own program. And uh, it's not only for us, but for the general people's storytelling. We have a regular, regular program. And also, we made a, a website. And these uh, try to make a complex uh, kind of the tiny but complex uh, media ecosystem for uh, 10 years. It, it works. It, it, it has not a big power, but it works. And uh, recently, I discussed with my Korean and Belgian you know, uh, uh, colleagues, and they are doing, for example, in Namur city of Belgium, they are doing a very interesting connected activities. And the Incheon of the, it's a, third largest city in South Korea, they have their own community center, museum, cable TV a connection each other. And we, we can try to connect uh, each other transnationally. And of course, these are very tiny, tiny, you know, uh, activities and it's very grassroots. It, it has a clear limitation, but still it's, it must be a kind of the place for awareness of the media's existence, platform and uh, infrastructure existence among the capitalized media ecosystem. And lastly, uh, it's our uh, future plan, or no, no present and future plan, but uh, from around 2018, I am very much uh, connected with uh, activities called platform cooperativism. Uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, trumpeted by uh, uh, Trevor Schultz of the New School University. And uh, they tried to uh, operate the e-commerce the e in a very cope ways. 
And I am also very much uh, interested in the uh, cooperative managed platforms. So, and uh, from uh, I, I have been uh, working with the COP people. COP has a huge power in Japan, but they are very much very calm and bureaucratic among Japan's calm regimented society, but try to collaborate with them to think about the future activities of the media biotope or media literacy among the general citizen. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, so exciting, uh, lots of sort of, you know, working so long time, so therefore since uh, research is quite sort of significant and uh, sufficient result practice and outcome, quite impressive. But still, I think it's, you know, uh, in his presentation, key word is, is still awareness. And also active critical thinking is also very important to understand, better understand today's advanced information society with AI. And also uh, since the workshop, this suggests also importance of to have ability, you know, imagination, creativity, innovation, innovatives. So, but these abilities could be easily lose if we depend on AI too much. So that's really interesting. Looking forward to discussion. Okay, now we uh, move on uh, discussion time. Uh, we invite uh, Professor Matthew Fula from Gold Swiss as a discussant. Uh, Matthew Matthew Fuller is a professor of cultural studies at Goldsmith, University of London. Recent books include How to Be a Greek Essays on the Culture of Software, 2017, and How to Sleep, the Art, Biology, and the Culture and the Unconsciousness, 2018. This is with Olga uh, Gorio, Gorionova. And Bleak Joys, Aesthetics of Ecology and Impossibility, 2019. And with I. Weizmann, Investigative Aesthetics 2021, quite a lot of books. Uh, Fura, is, he, Fura is on the editorial group of Computational Culture, a journal of software studies. So please, uh, Matthew, take the, the microphone. Okay, thank you very much, Tomoko. That's uh, very kind. Um, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic kind of proof of the arguments uh, that we've heard here that uh, real, real media education must be communal and it must be done together uh, collectively. I feel um, you know, that I've learned an enormous amount just listening to these talks and finding the different perspectives uh, that are there and, and the, the different ways in which the question of AI and is, is addressed in these, in these different ways. So as a kind of uh, an event that makes its own argument, I think this is really, this is really interesting because we, we have the kind of formation of a, of a, of a temporary media biotope uh, that, is, that is not simply spatial, but is also uh, about learning and enacting through kind of collective uh, work on information. I, I wanted to kind of address each presentation um, in order in, in a sense, but first to think about this, this kind of common framing of AI in relationship to ethics and to, to wonder about whether that's, whether that's the right way of, uh, of, of setting up this debate uh, and whether we, if we move the question um, between backwards and forwards between the different scales of the ethical and the political, um, we are, were able to address the question uh, more fully. And partly the problem is that ethics in the, in the present is reduced often to a code of conduct, uh, a set of prescriptions that are primarily uh, injunctions not to do something rather than to do something uh, constructive in the, in the way that these, these three uh, speakers have kind of proposed in different ways. So this is partly because of the, the kind of political economy of ethics. And we can remember perhaps, um, you know, the, the upsurge in genomic ethics or the ethics of other kinds of technology from different decades as a new technology emerges and becomes more substantial. Uh, companies need to insure themselves against the risk 
or incurred by these technologies. So ethics uh, and you know this this case from of Timnit Gebru and Margaret Mitchell being expelled from Google uh, is a perfect case uh, because it's it's about a reduction of risk, not a genuine ethical encounter. And I think that's what we what we're looking at in these these three talks is, is this means of staging ethical encounters that, that are fully about the possibility of transformation and not simply about uh, a kind of holding on to what, what exists. So this, this is a wider question of ethics that, that moves easily across to the political and uh, the wider understanding of these, these structures and formations. So it's an ethics that is not grounded in the kind of constrained uh, morality of, um, uh, of of the terms of use, but is is much more about uh, the, the substantial ethical encounter that we're familiar with from the philosophies of of Levinas or Nietzsche or Spinoza in many different ways. Um, so I wanted to think about some of these uh, these ways in which AI sets up uh, these kind of ethical uh, and political uh, questions. And it seems that one of the, the kind of things that's um, happening in the present is this ability by different researchers to work out some of the uh, ways in which AI produces a politics, which is also read readable as, as ethics, uh, that runs across a number of these uh, different presentations. One is the question of the quality of the data. You know, so if we, the kind of the, the, the phrase from programming of garbage in, garbage out, uh, that, that AI simply repeats what it's presented with, as in the uh, Lee Luda chatbot or the Tay chatbot scandals. Um, but there is also this systemic disposition of software that's coded in, uh, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. Then we can say that there's an operation of AI software within a wider gendering or racializing uh, assemblage that produces effects that uh, are, are you know, inimical to, to ethics. Then we can say closely related to that, there is a, a systemic disposition of societies um, that use software, for instance, for sexist ends, as, you know, as, as uh, Professor Kaori uh, Hayashi uh, spoke about. And then lastly, the, the important um, argument that was made uh, by, by Timnit Gebru and her collaborators is the entrainment of systems to majority perspectives. And that is not only about uh, a statistical sampling, but is built into the question of seeing diversity as a statistical issue. You know, so there's something deeply epistemic uh, that we need, to, we need to look at. And so given, given these kind of initial, uh, initial thoughts, so I want to look at, uh, respond initially to Hayashi Kaori, um, and think about this, this absolutely essential work on, on gender that is being done, and think about how questions of, uh, of patriarchy uh, are built into contemporary technologies. And perhaps we can use these kind of questions of media literacy also to think about what it is that we mean by gender. So if we think of, of gender as itself a platform for the construction of uh, patriarchal societies, uh, the way in which gender provides the, the basic uh, structure of exploitation in which a society uh, is, is based, in which it's organized, we're, we're able to think about the gender as a technology and to start you know, rethinking, its, rethinking its design. And this is, this is an epistemic and experiential question uh, as well as a technological one. I think it's interesting, this, this question that of, of recursive popularity uh, by, by click-through rate um, that Atsushi Adegawa brought up is very close to the question of machine learning and how we entrain AI to learn uh, by repetition, by millions of repetitions. 
It's also very close to the way that Judith Butler talks about the formation of gender as a, as a kind of, uh, as a category. And, and Butler, um, I'm gonna quote a little from uh, her book, Bodies That Matter. And Butler says, uh, performativity, that is gender performativity, cannot be understood outside of a process of iterability, a regularized and constrained repetition of norms. And this repetition is not performed by a subject. This repetition is what enables a subject and constitutes the temporal condition for this subject. And this iterability implies that performance is not a singular act or event, but a ritualized production, a ritual reiterated and under and through constraint. So I'll, I'll stop the quote from Butler there, but we can see that this is, this is could almost be directly, um, you know, a description of the action of a neural network. You know, it's something that's entrained, it repeats, it reiterates, it's a recursive process. And this is what we, we can move this question of, of media literacy to the question of, of gender to think about, okay, how are we recursing gender? How are we reiterating and these micro scales in everyday interactions, the, the ways in which uh, patriarchy and uh, the techniques of domination, as, as Donna Haraway called it, are kind of reinforce um, these these kind of destructive but also constructive social forms. Um, so I think this this question of opening technology up uh, in the way that these presentations do allows us to also think about technology as a way of thinking about and recognizing uh, recognizing gender. Okay, I mean, this, I, I think there's there's enormous amount of work there, and I think the the BAI program and the way it, the way it addresses these problems looks looks extremely interesting, and we'll look forward to more uh, on that. But I wanted to move on to responding to uh, Atsushi Adagawa's um, paper, and I think again this is a really extremely interesting analysis. Um, especially given the predominance of Google in the West. I think the kind of fractures that are identified in the, in the search engine market um, in your paper are really not what, what is visible here. Uh, so in a way, um, it's, it's quite exemplary to see this and to think, okay, there are, there are other strategies, other futures uh, possible. And I'm interested in this question of the way in which a black box is, is not constructed by a technology, but by users that you propose through, through Latour's discussion of, of the black box. And this collaborative interaction of multiple actors um, can, be, can be seen, you know, one could describe it as the, through the kind of functionalist critique of actor network theory, that it, you simply provide uh, a mechanism for describing technical operations that in turn then justify um, uh, the, the existence of those operations and the technical objects that are described by them. So I wonder if, if you might think about um, the ways in which the power relations that are described um, in, in, this, in, the, in, in Professor Mitsukoshi's work around uh, the biotope, how do, these, how do these power relations and the form of creates the possibility of different kinds of addressability for black boxes. Where, do black, where does this formation of black boxes um, come, to, come to play through a political lens? So this is, you know, this is often the kind of critique of, of actor network theory that, it's, that it simply describes what is, uh, doesn't provide us enough with the tools to address uh, and open up these black boxes fully. So I, I wonder if that's um, uh, worth, worth kind of unpicking a little. Um, but it's also, I think that you one could take your challenge very strongly and say, okay, these technologies are constructed by users in some ways. And what are the interfaces by which we do construct them? Um, you know, so if AI is increasingly everywhere, um, but the behavior we engage with in this recursive and iterative manner is what trains these AIs to behave and then allows them to act upon us. Is our everyday behavior uh, also a form of programming? 
you know, is our interaction with these systems uh, a very simple form of programming that trains the, the neural networks, that trains these, these algorithms to respond to us? And if so, then uh, perhaps we have an interesting, uh, an interesting point of entry for thinking about forms of liter media literacy that would entail training, uh, training large-scale black box systems as a form of uh, as a form of politics, a form of ethics, and you know, as a, as a space in which we can retrain uh, these systems in some way. Um, and the kind of last question for you really is, 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 is computing is an extremely theory rich environment, uh, but it's quite hermetic. And I just wondered how you, uh, what you saw as the ways in which you might kind of open up the, the concerns of, of cultural theory, of media studies, of, of, liter of media literacy with uh, the kinds of very rich and very um, complex theoretical formations within, within computing. And I think you, you pointed towards some of those, but maybe that would be interesting uh, to discuss. And, and lastly, uh, Professor Shimizu uh beautiful proposition for practical work. And, you know, I think this is, uh, is really interesting, uh, partly because it, it shows the university as uh, a highly heterogeneous space that can produce interactions with with companies, with cooperatives, with neighborhood groups, um, that is able to work through multiple disciplines, through multiple epistemic frameworks and different kinds of practice. And it also makes me think that, you know, that the university as a, as a kind of, of institution or, you know, something that is beyond the kind of institutional um, is also diverse enough to assume different kinds of relations and to produce new kinds of ways of, uh, of practice, new forms of practice. Um, and one of these is to rework the idea of media literacy. And I think you, you know, your, your work uh, is very interesting in that you frame it through this, this question of a traditional media literacy via Stuart Hall, but then go on to show actually that media literacy is an active practice posed by addressing problems through metaphor, collaborative work, the necessity of forming sometimes uncomfortable collectives. And that's, uh, that seems to me quite an interesting idea of what, what, it, what does it mean for the, for the university uh, in the present? What kind of, what kind of organization uh, does, do your, do, does your work suggest? Um, and I think this, this, this idea of uh, the biotope uh, as, a, as a media approach, as a micro approach to ecology, taking very small, more small scale operations um, is a way of really experimenting with the, var the variables within the situation. So it shows the interconnection of different entities within the milieu or the, uh, to use the Simondonian phrase, or the kind of the ecology uh, in, the, in the situation. But it also shows there's almost no distinction between the technology per se and the multiple social processes it's part of and connected to, which I think is really is really valuable. But I wonder where um, this this kind of work allows for a reading of forms of power. Uh, you know, you you put the the biotope on the top of the pyramid of your diagrams. Um, how do you how do you read power? Uh, in the kind of everyday practice of producing these these biotypes, and you know what is the the encounter with power, and how do you how do you rework the the black boxes that you're presented with uh, in these cases? Okay, I mean I think I'll stop there, but it's um, I was taking so many notes and really inspired by the, <laughs> the discussion that some of this may have come across quite uh, chaotically. Uh, in some ways, but these are kind of um, initial responses that I think, uh, you know, these very three very kind of uh, potent presentations um, inspired in me, and I hope they're, they're relevant to other people listening. Okay, thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, but uh, very good uh, discussion, uh, comments on each individual uh, papers. Now, I think uh, we don't have a lot of time, time pressing. So therefore, just to please uh, uh, Kaori, Shin, and Atsushi, uh, if you want to respond to Matt's comments, and uh, just briefly uh, uh, respond to him. Maybe Kaori-san first. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, we have this COVID-19 problem. We, uh, all the shops will be closed in uh, within one hour, so we <laughs> kind of have to be hurry uh, in that sense. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for the very inspiring comments. And uh, yes, uh, gender is also a very problematic, in a way, uh, concept. And uh, we have to be alert to how to use this uh, uh, concept. But on the other hand, as uh, as the the uh, Stuart Hall uh, video shows that there are two veins. Uh, one is a kind of the very serious uh, uh, research attempt, and the other is a more practical way. And our emphasis is on the practical way, in a way, because uh, we, I think, we really have a need to communicate to science people here in Japan in a very serious way. Uh, we have to find a common language with them uh, and uh, to try to uh, persuade them how important it is to think about uh, the diversity or uh, gender uh, so that they can also participate in our discussion uh, to, uh, so that they can, they can develop uh, technologies uh, that are in a way the, uh, not so harmful <laughs> to our society. So uh, we are very aware of the need to critique this uh, gender trouble and so on. Uh, but uh, it is tendentiously in Japan that social scientists and humanities scholars are also uh, away from this practical uh, language world. So I think Shin's also initiative to uh, build a community to uh, and let them learn and media literacy uh, together with practitioners. That's, uh, that's something that we really need in this society to include others and let them also hear the other side of the opinion. <laughs> so, uh, but I am aware that the, your comment is very important and we also try to read uh, these uh, critiques uh, from outside of Japan, uh, reading the books uh, that are published uh, recently about AI and technology and also the ideologies of the uh, modern ideologies of the te te technology and so on. But yes, uh, that's <laughs> what I can say at this stage. I hope you could also join our discussion in future and also give us critiques of the uh, ideology of technology together with us. Thank you so much. Okay, so next, uh, maybe at some, please. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, so much about the, uh, the very fruitful comment and uh, questions. And uh, uh, let me uh, answer, uh, not directly, uh, but the uh, shortly. Uh, the basically the, your question is the, uh, what is the uh, interface uh, should be designed uh, under the, uh, this uh, situation, uh, considering the recursive amplifier of the uh, data. So uh, the, the one thing, is the, uh, to design uh, the interface to clarify the volume of data or the data source or the, uh, the judgment standards or kind of things. The, there is the very uh, various uh, things to visualize uh, the impact of the uh, parameters. Uh, so the uh, one, one uh, thing that from the designer's perspective, uh, it uh, should be more uh, clear interface uh, should be uh, planned uh, uh, from interface. But uh, uh, we should think about uh, this matter uh, from the out of the interface perspective. The, this uh, is a uh, very closely related uh, to the uh, media literacy concept uh, provided by uh, SIM. The, uh, the one idea is the uh, creating the communal 
community to ask what kind of uh, data uh, implemented for this interface or utilize the alternative interfaces uh, among the commun communal communication uh, with others, not individually. So the, uh, you can ask uh, the someone to the alternatives of the Googles, the someone use the DuckDuckGo uh, Duck, or the someone use other search engines or the SNS. The, uh, among these uh, communication, uh, we can uh, overcome the limitation of the interface. Uh, that's my idea. Uh, so that this is very closely to a uh, question about the media biotope. Uh, and uh, we need to keep discuss about these kind of things. Uh, thank you so much today. Okay, so finally, uh, Shin, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Matthew Fleur. Uh, your comments all are so keen and uh, uh, frankly, I cannot uh, clearly reply, you know. Um, well, one thing is that uh, university and, uh, you know, um, it's, it's resembled to the situation of the gender, gender matter, Kauri approval, the, the media literacy connecting to the society. It itself, this kind of the activity itself is very marginal <laughs> in the Imperial University of Tokyo. And uh, it's very imperial university, I think. And so the smell, uh, the, the general people hate. But at the same time, the, this University of Tokyo is a, like a huge dinosaur. And there are many, many rooms, like a stomach, or <laughs> many places where a small mammal, new type mammal can survive. So the, uh, I think that, um, uh, there are many engineering or scientific people, uh, administ uh, administrative officer who have the uh, very uh, diverse opinions. So what I have been doing is try to connect them each other in a very guerrilla-like way. And uh, also not only in the University of Tokyo, but uh, connected to the uh, you know, na nationwide university or schools is a uh, way I have been doing. But uh, our activity, is not officially, you know, you know, how shall I say, you know, accept, um, accepted or kind. It's it's not so institutionalized. So that's the situation, the reality. And the second point is also very important. And uh, yeah, I can I have to confess that I put the world media biotope in the black box <laughs> for more than one decade because it's too old, it's very utopian in the web 1.0 1, 1 days. So I put, I, I try to uh, put it, uh, I abandon it. But these days I try to, you know, uh, uh, you know, clean up it and try to use it intentionally. And um, I, but, but it means that the reason why I put this in the black, uh, box is uh, it has a clear limitation. You know, it's a, it has a clear limitation. It's only for the communal uh, situation. And I think uh, theoretically, we have to do this kind of uh, and, uh, activities under the framework of the Kauri's four dimensions and there are national, uh, transnational things. We have to you know, negotiate with the government or ministry, which I don't, uh, uh, it's, it's not my favor, but uh, we need that, those kind of things. The one thing I have been doing intentionally is that try to, I don't, I don't burn out the media industry or I don't burn out the ICT people, but to try to ask them to join our, our you know, workshop. The, in, in the, within the workshop, even the tentatively, you know, Google people, Rakuten people and the general uh, people uh, can be a kind of equal. We do the design for those kind of things. So uh, trying to introduce the industry people, tech people, and also school teachers. I have a kind of this subtle distance from the school education in the media literacy in Japan. It's so regimented and it's different from the UK, but still I think we need uh, collaboration with the school. And also the reason why I, I put the, on the table the matter of the COPE is the COPE has a huge power in Japan. 
So uh, it's not a direct answer to you about the power matter, but to try to you know um, make uh, again and again a kind of the very heterogeneous uh, connection is uh, something. So not the perfect answer, but uh, my comment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are timing, you know, time's running out. So I needed to uh, close soon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, such a stimulating and thought provoking uh, discussion. Uh, we hope that this seminar will be important to step in the de debates about AI and the society, focusing on new media literacy and the politics. And we are becoming increasingly aware of bias and the limitation inherent. Uh, AI system algorithm, big data analysis and practices we just discussed today. So these pressing issue we just discussed, we uh, crucially to help the better understanding uh, place of AI in society. So we much very much, we very much uh, like to keep you in the conversation. So the next webinar uh, seminar um, on AI in the society will be digital archive, time, space and the memory and on Wednesday 20th October. So detail of the event will be announced in the due course. So finally, thank you so much, Professor Kaori Hayashi, Professor Shin Mizukoshi, and uh, Atsushi Udagawa, and Professor Matthew Fura for participating in this event. Really, thank you very much. And I, I also would like to thank you, Zera Alabazi, uh, Phoenix Fry, Adrian De La Cote, and Gerald Lidstone from Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship, and Liu Kato from the University of Tokyo, and Mina and Mike Featherstone from the journal Theory, Culture, and Society. So this is that's all. Uh, thank you for joining us, and looking forward to seeing you again 20th October. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep in touch, please. See you again. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.